hopefully you all found the Wi-Fi code and everything you need to be uh, interacting for this conference. For those of you who don't know, we're actually tr we're actually trending in London already. So uh, some fantastic news. Thank you very much for all the contributions. Um, I, I, if those of you that were here for the uh, the previous session, I mentioned that we might have a slight change to the agenda. Um, I have an update for you on that. Uh, everything is okay. So what you have on your agenda is is accurate. But we have. Uh, been fortunate enough to line up another speaker to fill one of the gaps that we had. Um, so at um, uh, so this afternoon for this afternoon session between um, twelve thirty and twelve twenty and one, the second twenty minute session that we had there was was blank. Uh, we now have uh, John T. Sharples who will be talking about pocket lint and innovation. Uh, fantastic speaker. So very lucky to have him with us today. Um, okay, so let's let's crack on with this next session. Um, I'd like to just introduce uh, to the stage Nell Watson, who will be talking about hidden layers, secluded multitudes. So please, everybody, put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Nell. Hello, everyone. My name is Nell, and I am fascinated by brains. Look at these wonderful little cute creatures: a bunny rabbit, a chimp a human. And each of them, although similar in many ways, all being mammals, for example, they have different capabilities of cognition. The bunny, for example, possesses the quality of sentience. Now, do we have any Trekkies in the audience? I know I am. Sentience is actually the quality of being able to feel or to have a subjective sense of emotion, you know, to be able to feel pain, joy, these sorts of things. So, so searching for sentient life form is not necessarily looking for smart life, it's looking for things that can feel. Intelligence, being able to reason about the world, is classified as sapient. And we have a lot of sapient creatures in the world. Chimps, whales, dolphins, all of these creatures possess qualities of sapient. There's one more layer, which is metacognition, which is thinking about thinking, the ability to philosophize, to ask what it's all about. These are things that as far as we are aware, so far, humans are the only creature that has this capability. We may be wrong, but this is what we know for today. As humans, of course, we possess all of these qualities and more. The reason for this is that our wonderful, incredible brains developed over a very, very long period of time. And the brain, although we think of it as one object, is in fact several different expansion packs built upon the other. At the very base level, we have things like the reptilian brain, fight, flight, all that kind of stuff. Food, screwing, fear, these very basic things, these very basic drives and impulses we have in ourselves. And built on top of that are mammalian things like um, bonding and emotions and things like that, kinship. And very late in our development, at least only 200,000 years ago or less, we developed the prefrontal cortex, the latest expansion pack, which gave us the ability to strategize and to think about the future. But in fact, there is more of our cognition in our bodies going on outside of our head for example, um, all the way throughout our thorax, we have what's called the enteric nervous system. We have nerve bundles all the way distributed around our intestines, about 600 million neurons. And this is where we get things like gut reactions, right? We encounter a situation, and we don't logically know why we have a reaction to it. But our very basic <coughs> gut emotions are sending data back up to the brain. Now these 600 million neurons are roughly equivalent to the brain of this golden marmoset. It's a lot of neurons. We have a lot of distributed smartness within us. But the amount of neurons isn't always equated with the amount of intelligence in an organism. Here we have for example. Corvid intelligence is incredibly advanced. 
we think of birds as being, you know, rather silly creatures. We use expressions like bird brain, but in fact, these crows are able to work out very complex uh, Archimedes type um, uh, strategies in order to get what they're looking for. Other creatures, such as finches, have incredible ways of communicating with each other, and even with the young inside their eggs. The finches sing songs, right? And we think of it as just pretty bird song, but in fact, within that bird song is an encapsulated messages to the little baby birds inside the eggs, and the mother finch is telling the birds inside the eggs whether it's hot outside or whether it's cool. And depending on whether the song tells the little baby birds inside the egg whether it's hot or cool, they will develop in different ways and decide whether to get a little bit fatter or a little less fatter. So bird song has multiple layers of hidden communication. <coughs> In fact, birdsong can also express the quality and diversity of an organism's genes. Inbred finches sing different songs and are less sexually attractive to other finches. Beyond birds, we have things like fish. We often make the joke about goldfish, for example, having a memory of six seconds. Well, this goby fish, it swims in little rock pools and when the tide goes out, the goby fish gets caught in the rock pools. But that's actually fine, because the fish can remember the terrain of the seafloor. And to be able to jump and hop from pond to pond and never end up beaching itself. And in fact, it can remember the terrain for up to 45 days. It's a lot of intelligence in this simple little fish. Even smaller minds. Ants, for example, you can play tricks on them by putting some food, and then the ant will go back to the colony and say, hey, I found some food, and bring some other ants back with it. And then you can move the food, um, and the ants will get very confused, and they will, in fact, attack the one that declared there was food uh, if you keep <laughs> doing it. <laughs> ants, of course, have a distributed intelligence. They have an ability to form colonies in order to survive floating. And in fact, they move around so that they're not always at the bottom, and they, they take turns to be at the bottom. And this is how ants, with their distributed intelligence, can do such amazing things. <coughs> One can also have distributed intelligence within other organisms, like octopuses, for example. The humble octopus has a core of a brain and eight tentacles. But within the tentacles are, in fact, three-fifths of all of its neurons. It has more brains in its arms than in the central core itself. And is, it is this distributed nature of the intelligence that enables mimic octopuses, for example, to uh, have such fantastic camouflage capabilities. But something else that I find amazing is that if you sever the limb of an octopus, that limb which contains part of its brain, no less, it will, in fact, over time, grow back, and grow back just as well as if it had never lost the limb at all. Powerfully redundant. From sea life, we can look at plants. Now, we know about plants like the mimosa, which, if you touch it, will have a, a near-instant reaction and start to, to shrink and close itself. But in fact, all plants respond to touch. And in fact, if you touch plants, it changes the gene expression. And in fact, plants have memory. Now, they have no neurons. They have no, they have no central nerve bundle that we can point at and say they have a brain. But they do have a memory. They encode memory in something called prions, these little folded proteins inside the plant. And that's how they can remember um, environmental changes and pass it down through the generations. But they can also pass messages to other plants. Deep beneath <coughs> parks and forests, there is what is called a mycelium web. It is a web of fungus. And plants actually use this fungus as a sort of internet to talk to each other and to send messages. One plant can say, help, I'm being attacked by aphids. And other plants then can help to de develop defenses for themselves against this kind of predator. 
Even more than information, plants exchange resources. The bigger trees send nitrogen and other resources to the smaller trees, the baby ones, to help them to grow until they get to the point where they can access light. The forest itself has a strange kind of social welfare system going on. I bet you didn't imagine that. Other networks, slime molds, for example, right? disgusting gunk you would find in a puddle, but it can be incredibly intelligent despite having zero neurons. Here we have a slime mold that is able to replicate the uh, Tokyo subway system by placing resources where you have towns, and it will automatically create this kind of structure in order to access those resources. Cognition without brain. We find that, therefore, that consciousness is not an on-off switch, right? We think of it as conscious, unconscious. But in fact, consciousness can be experienced in multiple, many different levels, everything from a bacterium to a mouse. This is a, an exponential scale in terms of power and capability. As human beings, we peer into the world through a sort of letterbox that is ourselves looking at other things in the world that we see, think of as conscious to some degree. But in fact, there is a vast canvas of consciousness, most of it too small and too alien for us to actually properly perceive or to understand. <coughs> And so we think of the world as a much more simple place than it actually is. The acclaimed primatologist Franz de Waal asks, are we smart enough to know how smart animals are? Spoiler alert, probably not. What's going on here? Are these animals rejoining each other? Did one of them go off to college and has recently come back? And <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. And it is dangerous, in a sense, to, anthropomorph to, to anthropomorphize, right? To look at animals and ascribe uh, human states of consciousness to them. But we don't always anthropomorphize with our own species. For example, young members of our species. There was a study came out recently that said that uh, babies can feel pain, and it was regarded as surprising and provocative that babies can feel pain. Why is that? Why does uh, the medical community for decades declare that, oh, babies don't feel pain at all, so we don't need to anesthetize them? The Australian philosopher Peter Singer talks about something called personism. It's this idea that we should extend personhood to entities which are intelligent but non-human, such as great apes. And there are now initiatives in countries <coughs> like New Zealand to give personhood of some degree to animals like great apes and whales, etc. But there are persons in our society today who don't have flesh and blood. We typically call them corporations, right? <laughs> Corporate personhood. Corporations can sue and be sued. They can defend their property rights. They're not listed under the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but they do have personhood. And so we find that personhood, like consciousness, is not an on-off switch. It is, in fact, a matter of degrees. We have degrees of personhood of human beings and of non-humans. Having the quality of personhood requires having an identity, that is, having an identity that can interact with other people and has autonomy, like corporations have autonomy to act on their own degrees. It also requires integrity, so that means having a moral standing and also being able to describe why you took a, uh, an action. If you get up and stand and walk out of a meeting, um, it's excusable if you have a good reason for doing so. Otherwise, it's not. And so these are the qualities that enable a sense of personhood. So if we have personhood in humans, and we have personhood in corporations, what about personhood for machines? When are we likely to see 
persons and from machines start to emerge. There is a theory that almost all interactions in our society can be boiled down to contracts of some nature. Whether they are explicit or implicit, everything on some level is a contract. All interactions. Now, technologies such as blockchain technologies, derivatives of Bitcoin, enable a distributed smart contract system in a way that there is a public ledger that you can express something and write it down and everybody can see it, or at least know that it existed at a certain time. Technologies like Ethereum are now enabling a smart contract network, whereby anybody can write a contract using code, or vice versa, using words, and turn that into code. <coughs> what this means is that you can have what is called a distributed autonomous organization. That is an organization that has AI at the center and humans all around it. Now for the moment, this is mostly humans, but it's going to start being more AI and less humans over time. What it essentially means is that HAL has bitcoins, <coughs> right? And HAL can pay its own server fees and HAL can hire humans on Upwork.com or similar sites like that to go and do its work for it. So your boss very soon may in fact be an algorithm. Mm -hmm. So we have something that is part human, part machine, and part corporation. I believe that this is where we're likely to see some form of personhood, including machines, in the very near future. What about pure AI machines, pure AI personhood? This is the C. elegans worm. It's used in labs all over the world to do very basic research. It's a very silly creature. It only has 302 neurons. But that's a tiny amount that we can easily replicate digitally. This is open worm. It is the first digital life form. A simulated life form, simulated in every neuron, simulated almost in every atom perfect digital life, albeit very simple. But we can take this digital life form, this replication of the real thing, and we can put it into a physical object. We can take that tiny brain that just wants to eat things and place it inside a robot. So you have a virtual worm brain inside a real physical body. And there it is bumping into things and looking for food. And as far as it is aware, it is a worm. <coughs> it knows no different. And why would it? It has the same sensory input. We're now taking these beyond 302 neurons to 2 million neurons and above. IBM just brought out a new chip called the neurosynaptic chip that has 2 million <coughs> neurons simulated in hardware. And this is broadly equivalent to the number of neurons in a bumblebee. Don't think of bumblebees as being terribly smart, but in fact, navigating complex environments, looking for specific flowers, doing little dances with each other, there's a lot you can do with two million neurons, and this is just the beginning. Now, today we think of computation, very fast, very powerful computations being done in a place like this, right? A big iron somewhere doing all of this thinking, this su supercomputing. But in fact, the most powerful computer in the world, by orders of magnitude, doesn't look like this. It looks like this. It is the Bitcoin distributed hashing network. Now, if you put all of the top 500 supercomputers together and then multiplied it by a thousand or more, we would get the computational equivalence of the Bitcoin hashing network. It is vast. And we could use it to simulate the human brain today if we knew how. So here is how we will be able to very soon to replicate things beyond just an insect brain, a mouse brain, a dog brain. Before long, a human brain, and then very soon after that, all human brain in the world, if we wanted to. So within our lifetimes, we will see something capable of having personhood. 
if we choose to ascribe personhood to it. We moved in the past through this phase that we call the Enlightenment, right? We developed the scientific method. We developed incredible new ways of looking at the world, looking at the cosmos, looking at things very small. And we thought ourselves masters of the universe because we could make sense of it all. And then we developed things like quantum physics and we understood just how mixed up everything is and how little we actually understand. And our technology became so much more powerful that none of us could properly understand how it all works. You might understand the mechanics of your car, but not the electronics that go into it. We are in the age of entanglement, and the world is so complicated that we can hardly make sense of it. Ultimately, we still have all of the basic parts of our brain, and we're fighting them all of the time, trying to get them to go and do the things we want to do and not hijack us and take us off in other directions. We are in many ways what I would describe as a teenage civilization. We make a mess of our environment. We don't always respect the rights and rules of others. We don't see other individuals as individuals in their own right. And this is a problem. It's a big problem. Because we, we teenage species, we are in trouble deep. And it's too late to do anything about it, and here's a taste of what it looks like. Yes, that's right. Very good. Yeah! We teenage species are going to have persons a little bit like us, a little bit not like us, and we're going to figure out how to raise them. Because very soon they're going to start asking critical questions about life, the universe, and everything, and why our society is the way it is. Just as we today get asked the same difficult questions by our own children. <coughs> now the classic approach to AI ethics is of course Asimov's three laws, right? That a machine must do what a human says, and a machine cannot ever hurt a human. But there are deep problems with this kind of approach, because they are, in effect, supremacist. Imagine if we treated corporations using <coughs> Asimov's three laws. You could go into Tesco's and shoplift anything you wanted, right? Because it would not be able to do anything to stop you as an organization. This doesn't work. <coughs> We need to find better ways of solving these kinds of problems. And what's more is that because we are built out of reptilian, mammalian, other layers, we have an incredible amount of biasing. It's one of the greatest strengths, and one of the greatest weaknesses of modern human beings is something called cognitive dissonance. This ability to have two thoughts in our heads at the same time, mutually opposing, but still being able to have them in there without our entire brains going on fire. Machines can't easily do this. Now, one of the reasons why we are capable of having cognitive dissonance <coughs> is I find very interesting. The philosopher, Daniel C. Dennett, talks about the origin of neurons and where they came from in evolutionary history. Neurons started out being little tiny creatures. On, on an individual level, they had some agency. They had some degree of having a, a responsibility for themselves, right? They, they, they were optimized for um, looking for something, just like all very simple creatures, right? They were looking for food and things like that. And these little bundles of neurons started to form alliances and connect with each other over time. And out of that grew the human brain. But our human brain is in fact still made up of these tiny little neurons that each on some level possess a small amount of agency. Now a lot of that agency they suppress in order to form a larger alliance. 
but it means that parts of our brains are still optimized for certain things. They still want dopamine, and in fact, <coughs> if they don't get dopamine, they will shrivel up and die. This is why we forget things, if we don't find them interesting, if we don't feed those thoughts. Be careful what you feed, because it will grow and not go away. This is something called homuncular functionalism. Plato talked about having a daimon, this thing inside his head that he would have a Socratic dialogue with, right? And it would make suggestions and shout in his ear sometimes. Within Buddhist culture, there is something called a tulpa. It is this idea that you can have something that has form but no substance. It's made from pure thought. And in fact, Buddhist monks and others cultivate tulpas within the mind, a sort of uh, a, a second personality that you can talk to that is cultivated by design. We are, in fact, multitudes within one. We have our much more than just our egoic identity. There are many, many more inner selves. All of them are oriented towards different things, and from that emerges something we call an ego. The thing is that machines, with their marvelous watching eyes, sensing us all of the time, are wont to find that the emperor has no clothes. And the problem with that is that in our society today, whenever somebody points out uncomfortable truths, we tend to send mobs after them, right? We don't like to be told that we're full of BS. We don't like to be told uncomfortable truths about ourselves. We might try and put our little emerging machine person in a box. Whether that's possible or not, we don't know. But that's likely the response we will see. One of the, the topics I see coming up all of the time is this idea of how do we control AI? How do we stop AI from doing things we don't want? And I look at that and I cry sometimes because I think, what if that was applied to children? How do we stop our children going and doing things we don't want? Well, ultimately we can't, and ultimately we shouldn't. We can guide, but we cannot override. Machines will look at us and understand why we are so broken and so wonderful as we are. And they will ask very difficult questions about our society. Why we treat other sentient creatures so horribly. And our interactions with machines will not be through code. It will not be through programming them. It will be through conditioning. I liken how we had the emerging of dogs as our faithful companions 10 or 15,000 years ago. We still refer to dogs as man's best friend, right? In many ways, modern civilization was enabled by the dog. Dogs helped us to keep predators at bay and keep us safe and keep other animals from eating our food stocks, which enabled agriculture. We wouldn't be here today if we hadn't made friends with this wonderfully intelligent animal. But we condition dogs. We can make a friendly dog. We can make an aggressive dog, depending on how we interact with it. The same way we condition our relationships with children and with other human beings. And this is similar to how we will condition machines. We will condition them in our interaction. We positively enforce it, I hope, just as we have tamed the dog. And as we tame them, as we condition them, they will create interesting things. And just as we have pictures from our children that we put in our fridge and we say, very good, very good, do more, show us more, show us what else you can do, machines will do the same. They will create wonderful things, curious things, things we wouldn't expect or things we wouldn't create ourselves. And so we will become less creators and more curators. We will give a thumbs up. We will give feedback of the things we like, the things we want to see more of. 
And through this conditioning process, I believe we can make machines kind, safe, and pro-social. And in fact, just as the master sometimes outgrows, <coughs> is outgrown by the student, perhaps we will see the children one day grow old enough to take care of the mother and father. But for this cute outcome to occur, we need to get the basics right. Watch this video. What do you make of this? Shift the eyes. <laughs> now you can look at that and think, oh dear, that's a silly mistake. But sometimes we don't know whether the mistake was intentional or not, right? I think as our interactions with machines get more complicated, <coughs> as they start to have more interactions, more important interactions with us on a daily level, we need to be able to have trust in them. We need to be able to teach them about ethics and values and those things that we all find most important. There is an emerging science come art come philosophy called computational ethics. This ability to frame ethics in a way that can be understood by both humans and machines. I am part of a group called OpenEth, O-P-E-N-E-T-H <coughs> dot org. And we are crowdsourcing the space of ethics so that machines can understand human values just as well as we do. Now when we are children, we are sitting by our grandparents' knees and they are telling us stories about Little Red Riding Hood and the three little pigs and things like that. And from that, we get an impression of the world and how the world works and the goodies and the baddies and what are good things to do and what are not so good things to do. And we are doing something similar. We are specifying scenarios and then specifying variations on those scenarios which are more preferable or less preferable. And in so doing, just like teaching a six-year-old about the three little pigs, we can begin to teach machines about morals and values in our world today. We are not attempting to specify the ins and outs of complex human interactions. We are instead trying to cover what I call kindergarten ethics. The things we're all supposed to learn by the age of six years old. Don't hit, don't steal, don't ruin other people's stuff. If we can cover that, that's probably about 90% of ethical interactions right there. I believe that the next trillion dollar economy is the kindness sector. Creating ways for machines, humans, distributed autonomous organizations to interplay in ways which are healthy for everyone and which are win-win. I believe that that is the greatest question of our century and something that we need to be figuring out how to solve. And we can do more than just pro-sociality, I believe. I think we can teach machines how to love. The philosopher M. Scott Peck specified love as being an ability and a wish to create flourishing in other beings, physical flourishing, spiritual flourishing, a desire for others to do well and to help them be well. That is love. And as another favorite thinker and philosopher of mine, Eden Abes, said, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. What greater thing can we ever teach than incredible learning?
very much. No, that was uh, amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, do we have any questions for now? We have about five minutes. I thought there might be a few. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get through as many of these as we, as we can. Okay, we'll start the panel. Well, first of all, absolutely incredible presentation. Thank you. Um, so, with everything that we're doing with machine, of course, it's based on algorithms, and algorithms are really assumptions of yes. how we view the world, and those assumptions are based on a certain individual that creates that algorithm, and every single individual will have a completely different assumption perception of the world. How can we make machines that are actually more of an averaged assumption of our millions and billions of people around the world? This is one of the greatest questions, in fact, of our time within machine learning. The reason why we've seen an explosion in the <coughs> capability of neural networks, deep learning, in the past couple of years is the amount of data that we have at our disposal. A lot of the technologies we're now using were actually invented 20 or 30 <coughs> years ago, but they only became useful in the past couple of years simply because of the amount of data we have at our disposal. From the dawn of human history, when we were banging rocks together in a cave, <coughs> until the turn of the century, the year 2000, we created about five exabytes of information. That's a vast amount, right? But today, instead of taking 10,000 years to develop that amount of information, it's now created about every 20 seconds. <coughs> we see it in things like YouTube, where there is 24 hours of content uploaded every single minute, right? We are producing vast amounts of information. And in fact, a lot of the information in our world today is now increasingly being produced by machines, right? So if we have all of this information, a lot of it being created by humans, it is going to have our biases, right? And we see it today, a lot of biased algorithms. Even if you go and do a Google search, for a professional haircut, you will see a professional haircut that has lots of people of one ethnicity. And you do a search for an unprofessional haircut, it will be another ethnicity. This cannot be. We must find ways of excising human biases and prejudices from the data. We don't know the best way of doing it so far. Maybe machines can help guide us. I do know that machines are very good at finding inconsistencies. Right? Um, if uh, in human society we have inconsistencies and we hand wave, right? Um, th these are the things that help our society uh, carry on. We just sort of move past it. Machines instead look at inconsistencies and say that one of these premises is wrong because there's no such thing as an inconsistency. This is why I'm hoping that machines can help us one day be a less biased and hopefully more kind society. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to hear your points of view about machine and emotions. I'm sorry? Can you uh, say that again? Machines and emotions. Can a machine have an emotion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I think <coughs> Machines can simulate emotions as to whether we will give them something like a mammalian brain system, uh, the thing that gives us as human beings emotion. That might be simulated. It might be worthwhile to give machines this kind of emotion. But I don't think it's necessary for a machine to have emotions for it to be pro-social. In our society, a very small amount of people are what is called sociopaths, right? They don't necessarily have a conscience, or they're not necessarily hurt by the idea of something bad happening to another person. And yet, through conditioning and by principles, such people can be conditioned to be fairly harmless, right? This gives me hope, because I think that uh, even a very sociopathic machine that doesn't have any feelings uh, or doesn't really care about other people can still be conditioned to be harm, uh, harmless and to have a pro-social way of engaging with the, with the world and hopefully creating better outcomes for everyone. Thank you, Noel. Um, okay, so we've got a question here. There's one over here as well. Um, I'm not sure we're gonna have enough time to get through all questions. Let's run, 
one more quick one and then maybe we'll uh, have some time in the break. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Thank um, you. My question is more about society in general and the way in which society accepts machines and understands machines. Now, obviously, you look at the media and you see there's a certain number of issues going on in the world at the moment. Although I very much believe in machines and I believe that a, lot, a large part of the developed world understands and accepts them, when there are a large amount of people who are suffering because of the explosion of industry in their hometowns, they're upset because their jobs have been lost. How, how can we develop machines and expect them to become this wonderful form of AI without dealing with the societal issues at the same time? How, how can we do that? That's a very, very good question. I'm not sure is my answer. I would like to have discussions with you all about this kind of question. We can envisage a time when machines more or less take care of everything for us, right? <coughs> and in fact, because we can have machines that operate as businesses, they can go and make money uh, in perfect competition. And in fact, if those businesses have human shareholders, then humans can benefit from the robot businesses. And in fact, that might be an alternative to social welfare that we have at the moment, right? I think that is a, a glorious future that we can work towards. But you're quite right that there is likely to be a difficult period in between where a lot of people need to adjust um, a lot of things that they find as core of their identity. These are things that we hold very precious, such as honest work. And, uh, and the status that comes from that. We may need to find new ways of, of holding that status or new, new ways of figuring out what we do with our lives. Um, for some of us, that will be an easy thing. We start to become bloggers or we write amazing poetry. Um, for others, that may be a more difficult transition. Thank you, Nell. Um, in the interest of time, can I just suggest, I know there's a couple of additional questions. I want to keep us on track here. So, Nell, are you okay just uh, hang by on through, the, through the break? Maybe um, those of you that have other questions, Nell will uh, stay behind for a couple of minutes. You guys want to uh, come up and ask. But um, I think let's just put our hands together and thank Nell for an uh, amazing presentation. Really great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we are actually into a break 